committee meets today for a hearing on the posture of the United States Cyber Command. We're pleased to welcome back Admiral Mike Rogers, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, director of the National Security Agency, chief of the Central Security Service, and several other titles, I believe. We are grateful for your many years of distinguished service and for your appearance before the committee today. <clears throat> Threats to the United States in cyberspace continue to grow in scope and severity, but our nation remains woefully unprepared to address these threats, which will be a defining feature of 20th, 21st century warfare. <clears throat> As a result, this committee has focused its attention on cybersecurity. We've expressed our concern at the lack of a strategy and policy for addressing our cyber threats. We were hopeful that after years without any serious effort to develop a cyber deterrence policy and strategy from the last administration, the new administration promised one within 90 days of the inauguration. But 90 days have come and gone, and no such policy and strategy have been provided. While inaction from the executive branch has been disheartening, this committee has not stood still. In fact, this committee has adopted more than 50 provisions over the past four years focused on organizing, empowering, and enabling the Department of Defense to deter and defend against threats in cyberspace. But cyber is an issue that requires an integrated, whole-of-government approach. We simply do not have that now. The very fact that each agency of government believes it is responsible for defending the homeland is emblematic of our dysfunction. We have developed seams that we know our adversaries will use against us, yet we fail to summon the will to address these seams through reform. Our allies, most notably the United Kingdom, have recognized the need for a unified approach. I look forward to hearing from Admiral Rogers his assessment of the recently established National Cyber Security Center in the UK, and whether a unified model would help address some of our deficiencies here in the United States. The Coast Guard also presents an interesting model that should be evaluated for addressing some of our cyber deficiencies. The Coast Guard has an inter interesting mix of authorities that may be just as apl applicable in cyberspace as they are in territorial waters. They're both an agency within the Department of Homeland Security as well as a branch of the Armed Services. They can operate both within the United States and internationally and can seamlessly transition from law enforcement to military authorities. A cyber analog to the Coast Guard could be a powerful tool for addressing gaps that impede our existing organizational structure. It could also serve as a much needed cyber first response team responsible for immediate triage and handoffs to the appropriate federal entity for further response, remediation, or law enforcement action. As for the efforts at the Department of Defense, I understand that Cyber Command is still on track to reaching full operational capability for the training of the Cyber Mission Force in the fall of 2018. But unless we see dramatic changes in future budgets, I'm concerned these forces will lack the tools required to protect, deter, and respond to malicious cyber behavior. In short, unless the services begin to prioritize and deliver the cyber weapon systems necessary to fight in cyberspace, we're headed down the path to a hollow cyber force. I also am concerned with the apparent lack of trained people ready to replace individuals at the conclusion of their first assignments on the cyber mission force. Unfortunately, we have already heard about some puzzling issues. Specifically, out of the 127 Air Force cyber officers that completed their first tour on the cyber mission force, none went back to a cyber-related job. That is unacceptable and suggests a troubling lack of focus. It should be obvious the development of a steady pipeline of new talent and the retention of the ones we've trained already is essential to the success of the cyber mission force. <clears throat> Admiral Rogers, we look to you to help us better understand if we should take a closer look at if the existing man, train, and equip models of the services are sufficient or if we should consider a different model. Later this week, we plan to have another cyber hearing with outside experts of which we plan to ask if we should be considering the creation of a cyber service. Admiral Rogers, welcome back. This is, I'm sure, one of <coughs> numerous pleasures you've had of coming before this committee. Welcome, Senator Reid. 
Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me join you uh, in welcoming Admiral Rogers. And as you point out, Mr. Chairman, the, the frequency which the Admiral has called up to testify at the committee is a testament of not just his importance, but the importance of cyber and the severe challenges we face in this domain. So again, thank you, Admiral, for your service and your dedication. We have faced serious and growing threats in cyberspace from espionage, theft of intellectual property, and destructive attacks on the networks and systems that support our military and our economy, including critical infrastructure. Now we and our allies in Europe are experiencing firsthand that we are also vulnerable to the manipulation and distortion of information through cyberspace, which Russia is exploiting to threaten the bedrock of our democracy and our shared international institutions. The Armed Services Committee has for years emphasized the importance of developing the means and the strategy to deter cyber attacks. Now the scope of what we must defend against and deter is expanded, and the task takes on even greater urgency. In just a year's time, we will be in an election season once more, and the intelligence community has warned that Russia's election interference is likely to be a new normal. While our decentralized election system has been designated as critical infrastructure, we lack an effective, integrated, and coordinated capability to detect and counter the kind of influence operation that Russia now routinely and continuously conducts. We do not yet have a strategy or capabilities to deter such actions through the demonstrated ability to conduct our own operations of this type. Secretary Carter commissioned a Defense Science Board Task Force on Cyber Deterrence. Prominent former officials, such as former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Dr. James Miller, served on this task force and have testified to this committee twice this year. They advocate rapidly developing the ability to conduct operations through cyberspace to threaten, quote, what key leaders on the other side value the most, which in the case of Russia could include their own financial well-being and status in order to deter influence operation and cyber attacks against us. Achieving a credible deterrent requires integration of capabilities and focused policy development across the Department of Defense, as well as through the whole of government, involving DOD, the State Department, the Intelligence Community, DHS, and the Justice Department. We have not seen evidence yet that the new administration appreciates these urgent problems and intends to address them. For Cyber Command specifically, the committee has heard concerns that our military cyber forces are almost exclusively focused on the technical aspects of cyberspace operations, such as detecting network intrusions, expelling intruders, and figuring out how to penetrate the networks of adversaries. The concern is that this focus misses the crucial cognitive element of information operations conducted through cyberspace, those actions designed to manipulate perceptions and influence decision making. Admiral Rogers, these are critical issues, and there is much work to do, and I look forward to your testimony and your views on these urgent matters. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back, Admiral. Thank you, sir. Chairman McCain, Ranking Member Reed, and members of the committee, thank you for your enduring support and the opportunity today to talk about the hardworking men and women of United States Cyber Command. I welcome the opportunity to describe how Cyber Command conducts efforts in the cyberspace domain and supports the nation's defense against sophisticated and powerful adversaries. The Department of Defense recognized seven years ago that the nation needed a military command focused on cyberspace. U.S. Cyber Command and its subordinate elements have been given the responsibility to direct, operate, secure, and defend the department's systems and networks, which are fundamental to the execution of all DOD missions. The department and the nation also rely on Cyber Command to build ready cyber forces and to be prepared to employ them when significant cyber attacks against the nation's critical infrastructure require DOD support. The pace of international conflict and cyberspace threats has intensified over the last few years. Hardly a day has gone by during my tenure at Cyber Command that we have not seen at least one significant cybersecurity event occurring somewhere in the world. And this has consequences for our military and our nation at large. We face a growing variety of advanced threats from actors who are operating with ever more sophistication, speed, and precision. At U.S. Cyber Command, we track state and non-state adversaries as they continue to expand their capabilities to advance their interests in and through cyberspace and try to undermine the United States' national interests and those of our allies. Conflict in the cyber domain is not simply a continuation of kinetic operations by digital means. It's unfolding according to its own logic, which we are continuing to better understand. And we are using this understanding to enhance the department and the nation's situational awareness and management of risk. I want to update you on our initiatives and plans to address that 
issue of situational awareness and risk management. Our three lines of operations are to provide mission assurance for DOD operations and defend the Department of Defense information environment, to support Joint Force Commander objectives globally, and to deter or defeat strategic threats to U.S. interests and critical infrastructure. We conduct full-spectrum military cyberspace operations to enable actions in all domains, ensure the U.S. and allied freedom of action in cyberspace, and deny the same to any adversaries. Defense of DOD's information networks remains our top priority, of course, and that includes weapon systems, platforms, and data. We are completing the build-out of the Cyber Mission Force, if you, as you heard the chairman indicate, with all teams scheduled to be fully operational by the end of fiscal year 18. And with the help from the services, we are continually increasing the Cyber Mission Force's readiness to hold targets at risk. Your strong and continuing support is critical to the success of the department in defending our national security interests, especially as we comply with the recent National Defense Authorization Act directive to elevate Cyber Command to unified combatant command status. As you well know, I serve as both commander of U.S. Cyber Command and director of the National Security Agency. This dual hat appointment underpins the close partnership between Cyber Command and NSA, a significant benefit in cyberspace operations. The institutional arrangement for providing that support, however, may evolve as Cyber Command grows to full proficiency in the future. The National Defense Authorization Act in a separate provision also described conditions for splitting the dual hat arrangement. Once that can happen without impairing either organization's effectiveness. This is another provision I have publicly stated that I support pending the attainment of certain critical conditions. Cyber Command will also engage with this committee on several other matters relating to the enhancement of the command's responsibilities and authorities over the coming year. This would include increasing our cyber manpower, increasing the professionalization of the cyber workforce, building capacity, and developing and streamlining acquisition processes. These are critical enablers for cyberspace operations in a dynamically changing global environment. Most or all of those, these particulars have been directed in recent National Defense Authorization Acts, and along with the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy and the Joint Staff, we'll work with you and your staffs to iron out the implementation details. Cyber Command personnel are proud of the roles they play in our nation's cyber efforts and are motivated to accomplish their assigned missions overseen by the Congress and particularly this committee. They work to secure and defend DOD systems and networks, counter adversaries and support national and joint warfighter objectives in and through cyberspace. The command's operational successes have validated concepts for creating cyber effects in the battlefield and beyond. Innovations are constantly emerging out of operational necessity and the real world experiences we are, in, we are having in meeting the requirements of national decision makers and joint force commanders continue to mature our operational approaches and effect in this over time. This combined with agile policies Faster decision-making processes, increased capabilities, broader concepts of operations, and smarter command and control structures will ensure that Cyber Command attains its potential, to, its full potential to counter adversary cyber strategies. The men and women of Cyber Command thank you for your support and appreciate your continued support as we confront and overcome the challenges that lie ahead of us. We understand that a frank and comprehensive engagement with Congress not only facilitates the support that allows us to accomplish our mission, but it also ensures that our fellow citizens understand and endorse our efforts executed on their behalf. I've seen the growth in the command size, budget, and missions. That investment of resources, time, and effort is paying off. And more importantly, it's helping to keep Americans safer, not only in cyberspace, but in other domains as well. I look forward to continuing the dialogue of the command and its progress with you in this hearing today and in the months to come. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank, Thank you, you Admiral. Uh, we've saw we've seen uh, another Russian attempt to affect the outcome of the election in France. Uh, do you see any slackening uh, or reduction in Russian slash Chinese efforts to uh, commit cyber attacks and even affect uh, elections? No, I do not. Have you seen any reduction in Russian behavior? No, I have not. The uh, Defense Science Board told this committee at least the next decade the offensive cyber capabilities of our most capable adversaries are likely to far exceed the United States' ability to defend key critical infrastructures. Do you agree with that assessment of the Defense Science Board? I agree that the offensive side in general has the advantage over the defense. 
which is why the ideas of deterrence are so important here. How do we shape and change opponents' behavior? In order to do that, we would have to have a policy followed by a strategy, right? Yes, sir. Do we have that now? No, sir, but the new team is working on that. I want to make sure we all understand that. And the check's in the mail. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Do you agree we should? Uh, uh, well, let me. We've got the we've got the Federal Bureau of Investigation as the lead for law enforcement. The Department of Homeland Security is the lead for critical infrastructure and defending government computer networks. And the Department of Defense is the lead for defending the homeland, defending military computer networks, and developing and employing. Mm -hmm. Is that is that is the status quo sustainable? It's sustainable, but my question is, is, is it the most effective way is it the most eff to generate That's a better question. Out Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and my, my recommendation, my input to this process has meant our challenge is, so we built a foundation with a series of very specialized and distinct responsibilities. And yet I think what experience has taught us over the last few years is it's our ability to respond in a much more integrated, focused way is really the key to success here. And I think that's the challenge. How do we more formally integrate these capabilities across the government? Do we need a cyber core? I'm not a proponent within the DOD. I am not a proponent of the idea of a separate cyber force or well, service, and that's for the following reasons. In my experience, to be successful in cyber, you not only under, need to understand the technical aspects of this, but you need to understand the broader context in which cyber evolutions occur. Somewhere in the world, there's a man or woman sitting on a keyboard directing an operation. And so my concern is if we went with a very unique service approach to this, we would generate a force that was incredibly technically proficient, but not necessarily deep in understanding of the broader context. And I think using the service-based model is a stronger way to, to go about doing this. Well, as I mentioned in my opening uh, remarks, uh, 127 or whatever it is in the Air Force, not a single one stayed in the cyber. What, uh, are you getting the kind of cooperation that you need to have trained people to, uh, at work on, in your command? So I've talked to all the service chiefs personally over the course of the last year on this topic. I have one service um, that I am particularly highlighting to them saying, look, we need to change the policies here. What I've suggested to the services is the cyber mission force, that part which I am responsible for, I acknowledge is only one part of the that, department's broader cyber needs. Was that, that, uh, was that message received by the United States Air Force? They're clearly still working their way through this. They have a broader uh -huh. in defense working, of the Air Force. I got it. They have a broader set of challenges with respect to manpower writ large. I personally had the chief of staff of the Air Force come out to Fort Meade. I sat him down and said, here's what I am seeing. Uh, you know, is this what is this? Do I have the right picture? Is this accurate? He has come back to me and said, no, Mike, you have an accurate sense that we are not where we need to be. And here's what I'm trying to do to get there. And so my job is to help him and also to keep the pressure on to make sure we sustain this. Uh, in your job, you have to look at scenarios. Mm -hmm. Give us the best scenario and the worst scenario for for cyber attacks on the United States. <sighs> The worst, worst case scenario, in my mind, has a couple dimensions to it. Outright destructive activity focused on some aspects of critical infrastructure. Including, spa including space. It could be space. In, and then in addition to outright destruction, the other thing that concerns me, there's two other things. The second thing would be, in terms of worst consequence, do we see data manipulation on a massive scale? Most cyber activity data has been penetration and extraction. Like Whether changing voting rolls. Yes. So what happens if we go in and we change data? That's a very different kind of challenge for us. And then thirdly to me, the other element of a worst case scenario, what happens when non-state actors decide that cyber now is an attractive weapon that enables them to destroy the status quo? That's kind of the worst the worst end, if you will. And the best. The best is... We develop a policy well, followed by a strategy. We continue to action. make improvements both in capacity as well as the broader deterrence piece. Thank you, Admiral. Sure. Senator Reid. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you, Admiral. Uh, as you've pointed out, and I think we both pointed out, uh, in terms of technical aspects of cyber, detecting intrusions, preventing intrusions, penetrating other networks, uh, Cyber Command has been in the forefront. 
Uh, but this issue, which you allude to, of cognitive operations, information warfare, the you know, changing public opinion, et cetera, uh, have you been tasked to conduct such operations, to prepare to conduct such operations? No, we have been not. That's not right now in our defined set of responsibilities, per se. Is it in anybody's set of responsibilities, to your knowledge? It's... Uh, there's some, I, I won't get into specifics yeah. in an unclassified form. Yep. There are some things we're doing right now, for example, in the fight against ISIS with other, with combatant commanders in this regard. I, I don't want to go any deeper mm -hmm. if I could. That's fine. Um, but I think one of our challenges is if, if information is now truly going to become a weapon, almost like in many ways, how are we going to optimize ourselves to deal with this world? And we had much of this skill. If you go back to the Cold War, when I first started my journey in uniform, we had extensive infrastructure, extensive expertise. As the Soviet Union collapsed, we decided perhaps that expertise isn't required. We did away with many of the institutions, many of the individuals who had the skill sets are no longer with us. I think we need to step back and reassess that. So I would assume that if you're, you've not been tasked to do that, that your expertise in cognitive warfare is rather limited in terms of the, those you just mentioned, the skill sets, the personnel. Yes, sir. I'd be the first to admit it's not what our workforce is optimized and for. And certainly not comparable to what we're perceiving from other actors around the globe. Certainly not on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, within DOD, my uh, uh, knowledge suggests that SOCOM has been given the, the lead on information operations. Broadly. Broadly. That that's and uh, is there any inter integration with Cyber Command? Oh, we work very... SOCOM is one of those partners that I mentioned. Um, right. So we do work very closely, General Thomas and I. And I, I think the other issue, too, and it's come up in the context of all of our comments this morning, mm -hmm. is that this is a mission that goes across several different organizations. Uh, and, in fact, we've heard comments about how the State Department in some areas has a you know, go back to the Cold War. They were doing the Voice of America. Right. They were doing all the, the radio towers that were beaming in. Mm -hmm. It's a new world. And they don't have the, either the expertise or the resources, et cetera. So no one seems to be doing this aggressively. Is that a fair estimate? Certainly we're not where we need to be. Right. That's uh, really fair. In terms of Russian operations, were, were you aware of the uh, penetration of the election in 2016 in terms of um, active involvement of Russian entities directly or indirectly? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, was there any, what actions did you take? Just simply informing the your superiors was that it? So um, here's where I have to differentiate between my role as commander of Cyber Command and the director right. of the National Security Agency. As the director of the National Security Agency, as I have publicly testified uh, before other committees, mm -hmm. when NSA first gained initial knowledge in the summer of 15 that the Russians were engaged in an effort to access political institutions, we informed the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which has overall responsibility to inform those organizations. I don't, as the director of NSA, I don't deal directly right with them. In turn, I then make sure that DOD and other elements within the government have that awareness. That's when my role as Cyber Command comes in. So as Cyber Command, I become aware of efforts in terms of intrusions and hacks directed against U.S. infrastructure. I turn to, to myself and make sure that the DOD system is optimized to withstand, because they were coming after DOD at the same time. In addition, we coordinate with the Department of Homeland Security. Is there a requirement for, are you looking for DOD? If we, for example, if we had defined voting infrastructure as critical infrastructure, then under the set of duties assigned to Cyber Command, had the President or the Secretary of Defense determined that DOD needed to do insert themselves in this, I would have been tasked to do that as Cyber Command. And, and so if you had been tasked, you would have been prepared technically to try to disrupt these operations? Yes. Um, and then again, given, I'm sure, we've all been looking back and the after action reports are still being written about 2016, in your estimate, we have to be much, much better prepared for 2018 and beyond. Is that fair? I apologize, Senator. Uh, I apologize. At the experience in 2016, you know, as you just described, knowledge of penetration, attribution to a, a foreign state, uh, going after key systems in this country, some of which have now been designated as critical right. infrastructure. 
uh, we have to be much, much better prepared for no, 18, yes, 20, and beyond. I agree. I apologize. I didn't No, know no. That. That's sure. fine, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Admiral Rogers, it would be unfair for me to ask you to evaluate the article I showed you sure. only this morning because you haven't read it yet. But sure. the title pretty much says it. It says that uh, it appeared this morning, Are Cyber Crooks Funding North Korea's Nukes? How does uh, Jim, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un come up with the billions to pay for nuclear tests? Increasingly successful online bank heists provide uh, a lot of the funding. Do you, does that make sense to you? So, so I'm not going to get into specifics in an unclassified form, but we have publicly acknowledged we have seen the North Koreans use cyber in a criminal mechanism, if you will, to, to generate monetary resources. To yeah, it has to come from somewhere. Sir. And, and when you look at it, you kind of eliminate, uh, you come down to that conclusion that they might be right on this. Right. Although I would highlight this is only one element of the North Korean broader attempt to generate revenue and, and get it back to North Korea. Yeah, well, you know, when we look at and, and see the, the, the growth in this thing from 2006 to 2015, the number of cyber attacks has climbed by 1,300 percent. And then you, uh, uh, you, you talk about, and we've all visited about the policy or the lack of policy and uh, making the decision. Uh, there's some thought that maybe the, there's too much authority at the top. It was General Goldfein that was quoted in December of last year, actually before this committee, he said, if we want to be more agile, then the reality is that we are going to have to push decision authority down to some lower levels in certain areas. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And we've highlighted in the cyber arena to Secretary Mattis as he has assumed his new responsibilities. I think this is an important area that we need to reassess, particularly yeah. within the cyber arena. Yeah. Uh, just a matter of a few weeks ago, we happened to be in, in, in Israel, and we met and talked to uh, their national cyber directorate, is Dr. Evitar Montagna, uh, uh, for a cyber subcommittee meeting. He actually came over, and we had, uh, it's the, it was Senator Rounds who was with me at that time, and of course he chairs the subcommittee, and we had a meeting that uh, I think was pretty productive. It, uh, Dr. Montano is very careful not to say that perhaps there might be doing something better there than we're doing. He said it's much more complex in the United States because of the size and, and all of that. But he also said, pointed out three things that were uh, uh, significant. And, and, and I just wondered if you had had any thoughts or if you uh, studied their system and maybe some other countries too. Uh, so what they're doing. with the uh, case of Dr. Matanya, there's a reason why every time I'm in Tel Aviv, I see him. And every time he's in the United States, he sees us. I knew that's I the case. He, he that said the same thing. From each other. And in fact, we are talking about some potential test cases that, that we could use with a new team in place. So we'll see how that plays out over time. But I look to him. I look, one of the things that I have learned in my journey in cyber is there is no one single organization, group, or entity that has all the answers. So it's about the power of partnerships here and how do you create a system that enables you to gain insight and knowledge from a whole host of, of partners, some within the United States, outside the United States, within the government, the academic world, industry. He's one example of the power of that to me. Yeah, I kind of got that impression too. The, um, when General Alexander was uh, in, in that position, he spent some time out at the University of Tulsa, and I know there are many other schools too. Mm -hmm. The chairman asked the question, are, are, are we having access to the people that are gonna become necessary for to staff this new, uh, very serious problem that we have? Uh, is there an effort going back to some of these schools and to promote the programs oh. as were promoted in that particular university? Oh, there is. Between NSA and Cyber Command, we have relationships right now with over 200 academic institutions around the United States because that's in part the future workforce for us. Although one thing I try to highlight uh, is be leery of creating a cyber force where everyone is cookie cutters. We need to get yeah. a broad range of skills and experience here. And some people are going to be really good at this and they won't necessarily have advanced education, but they've spent much of their personal life in this. So we've got to build a construct where we can get that full spectrum of capability. And, and you know, we, we look and we see what some of these countries are doing. Putin, when he came in after their, their uh, parliamentary election and they didn't have any communists for the first time in 96 years, 
uh, he started doing things in addition to just the coming in, coming in and, and, and declaring a level of warfare. Uh, he also started working, and apparently, according to uh, Poroshenko, they have used uh, cyber capabilities to attack the Ukra Ukrainian government uh, more than 6,500 times over the last two months. So this is something that is happening, not just, uh, it's mm -hmm. happening all over the world. Sure. And, and you see something like the example in uh, Ukraine that, that didn't take any lead time and all of a sudden they're already inflicting that uh, type of harm. And I'm sure that you're right on top of everything that's happening. We're trying. With us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Admiral, for your Admiral. public service. Uh, in response to Senator Reid, you said that you were aware of Russian attempts to interfere in our election. Are you aware, were you aware, of Russian uh, communications with members of the Trump campaign team? I'm not, now you're into my role as NSA, I'm here as Cyber Command, I'm, I'm not going to publicly get into that, sir. I thought, uh, I understand your reluctance, but <clears throat> I, I also see you not just Cyber Command, I see you as yes, NSA sir. Director. Okay. Um, uh, the chairman mentioned uh, and asked you, is this, uh, what we see this behavior, is this a new normal? Uh, to which you responded, uh, I think, somewhat regretfully, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, how should we counter these kind of cyber-enabled mm -hmm. information operations, and who has the responsibility for these kind of operations? In terms of Russian execution of the operations or our response? I'm, I apologize. I'm trying to understand both. both. Well, in the case of the Russians, um, again, if you refer to the publicly available inter in intelligence community assessment, we identified multiple Russian security elements that were involved in this campaign. Um, with respect to what should we do, the first is I think we need to publicly out this behavior. We need to have a public discourse on this. The, those nation states, groups, or individuals that would engage in this behavior, they need to know that we're willing to publicly identify them and publicly identify the behavior. Secondly, I think we've got to make this much more difficult for them to succeed. That means hardening our systems, taking a look at our election process, which is not you know, Cyber Command's role, but I think broadly we need to look at this end to end and ask ourselves what changes do we need to make in this structure. Thirdly, I think as a society, as a nation, we need to acclimatize ourselves to the idea that we're in many ways back into a time frame of disinformation, false news, manipulation, goes to Senator Reid's point, manipulation of media. You gotta be a much more discerning reader, so to speak, in many ways in the world that we're living in right now. Um, and then lastly, I think we also need to make it very clear to those nation states or groups that would engage in this behavior, it is unacceptable and there is a price to pay for doing this. So at this point, it, it sounds, uh, listening to the answers to the previous questions, that we are really in a position that we can't prevent a cyber attack on things like our critical infrastructure. Again, when we say prevent, it's one of the reasons why deterrence becomes so important. The goal should be we want to convince actors, you don't want to do this, regardless of whether you could be successful or not. You, it's not in your best interest, and you don't want to engage in this behavior. In a different setting uh, that is secure, would uh, you share with us where we have, either under the threat of an attack or an attack, deterred the word you just used, deterrence. Yes, sir, I could the, share with the, you in a classified setting the, where we've either driven them out of a network or... Um, <laughs> okay, that, that would be very yes, helpful. Now, uh, would you consider it critical infrastructure uh, voter registration roles? I think that one of the challenges, if you go back to the, the, the process we use to identify the current 16 defined critical infrastructure areas in the private sector, we tended to look at that from a very industrial, is there an output associated with it? One of the things I think that we need to be thinking about now is 
Not that an output isn't important, because you could argue an election generates an output, but does data and information exist in areas that's of critical consequence to us as a nation? We really didn't look at it that way in, in simplistic terms, and I think we need to. We need to reassess it. We sure better, because uh, if someone shows up to vote and suddenly they find out they're not a registered voter sure. because, indeed, it's been attacked and the data has been manipulated and taken them off the rolls, that's pretty serious. Yes, sir. And that's criti critical infrastructure. Yes, sir. We need to take a look at that definition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Let me follow up on the, the chairman's uh, statement um, w with regard to the Air Force cyber officers not remaining in, in that field of work. Would, would one of the reasons be because uh, they do not view it as a good career path? No. If, if I could say, when we say not in that field, the experience we're seeing is they're taking officers that are rolling out of the cyber mission force, that, that structure that I'm responsible for, and employing them in other areas in cyber in the department. That's why I say part of the challenge if you're a service, you have a wide spectrum of cyber requirements beyond just what cyber command is responsible for. It's why I'm trying to make the argument with the services. What we need to do is, and I've talked to them and said, look, I think you know, something on the order of a third should stay with us. The rest we should then look, how do we put them elsewhere with this, in this, within this broader cyber enterprise to build the cyber level of expertise across the department? I don't want to make it sound like what the Air Force is doing is just ripping people once they finish their three years with us, so to speak, and then making them airplane mechanics, for example. That's not what we're seeing at all. Okay, for the, for the third you'd like to keep, you think that's a good way to get to be a four-star? For... For, oh, do you mean, could you build a career over right. time? Well, clearly in the military we're moving into, I'm, I'm not the last person who's going to be doing this as a four-star, I don't think. Um, okay, and, and then with regard to the cyber service, which you are doubtful about, it, do I understand Britain does have such uh, a, a, a cyber... No, war? their structure is less a cyber service and more a combination of active as well as significant reserve. Is anybody trying this or any of our allies trying this? There's nobody right now who's really gone to a single cyber service. Most are trying to take within the existing service structure, can you create a dedicated work specialty, so to speak, where that's what you do for your career. That's what's being done by most nations around the world. Okay, well, keep us posted on that. Now, on page two of your written testimony, you say advanced states can continue to maintain the initiative just short of war, challenging our ability to react and respond, unquote. So what constitutes an act of war in, in your opinion or, or in, the, in terms of the policy of the agency? So first, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a policy individual. And that question at its heart is about legal, legality and policy. Um, it is clear that we do not, and not just the United States, I would argue broadly internationally, we haven't yet reached a broad consensus on how you would define in clear, actionable terms what an act of war within the cyber arena looks like. And to date... How are we going to do that? <laughs> We're going to get our policy people together. We're going to, and we're trying to discuss this broadly. I know, again, it's outside my lane, but I know we're um, involved in broad discussions both internally within the U.S. government as well as with foreign partners about how we develop a broader consensus on that. Well, but will help us out, though, because it's, it may not be in your lane. You're not a lawyer, you say, but, but um, you, you would certainly be one of the first people I would ask at, in, in terms of what sort of act... In, in your judgment, would 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 uh, go beyond this um, the, this threshold of war, right? So, what I look personally for me, what I look to do is, could we define a set of criteria: intent, impact, the, the tactics or techniques that were used, for example? Could we develop a set of very specific criteria that would help us define this, rather than this broad? nebulous is the wrong word because it implies people aren't really focused on it, but <laughs> this rather general kind of conversation we, we often tend to find ourselves in. I, I'm, I'm trying to mentally work myself through how could we get this down to a more specific set 
of attributes that would then help us, ah, I see those attributes, that therefore would be defined as an act of war, as an example. Um, and, and one other thing, you say technical developments are outpacing laws and policies. We certainly find that in the mm -hmm. commerce area also. Sir. Uh, but do, do, you need, do you need anything new in this next NDAA that you don't have now? I don't know, specific to the NDA, in broad terms, you know, my input to the process has been, we need to reassess authorities and delegation. We need to take a look at, do we have the right investments in manpower? Are we investing in the right capabilities? I'm very, I'm very honored that the department is focused on this mission. There shouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind. There is focus on this mission set. And I'm the first to acknowledge cyber competes with a broader range of priorities and needs. But the, challenge, the argument I'm trying to make is, within those priorities, I, I think cyber is pretty high, and we need to focus the investment and prioritize it. And we can't keep, we can't be willing to accept five to ten years for development cycles. Whether it's getting the right people, whether it's training them, that's just not going to get us where we need to be. To the extent that that laws and policies are being outpaced, tell us what you need. Let us know what you need. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, following the line of questioning by Senators Nelson and Reed, um, one of the issues raised by Russian intervention in our election is how our government as a whole responds to cyber attacks and how it escalates its response. Do you believe that there is a coherent plan in place to allow the federal government in coordination with state and local governments to respond to major cyber attacks on the country and to escalate the response as appropriate? To be honest, Senator, I don't know enough to accurately answer the question because some parts of that strategy would be outside my purview and I'm just not smart about all the sub -element. I'm not trying to be a, a smart ass, but part of this is just outside my knowledge. So I'm just not, I'm not positioned to say, a, a, Cate you know, categorically yes or no. So I was concerned by your earlier responses that your strategy is deterrence um, because I, I don't see how deterrence is going to work with regard to Russia uh, since we've seen a continuation of, of an interest on their part to hack our systems and hack other countries' systems and their elections. So I guess what I'm looking for you, from you is leadership in coordination with other right. government agencies throughout the U.S. government to be prepared for our oh, next yes, election. No, don't get me wrong, I'm part of this. If I could, I don't think you heard me say that I thought our strategy was deterrence. What I thought, at least, I communicated was deterrence should be a part of a broader strategy. It, it shouldn't be the only thing. I'm the first to acknowledge that. Do you think there's, um, particularly the transition between private companies and a government response, are there the authorities in place to accomplish these transitions effectively? And if not, what kind of authorities might you need? I don't know if it's, there's certainly an authorities aspect to it, but part of this I'm, I'm wondering is a cultural. So the government comes to a private entity, and you saw this in the Russian hack scenario, and the government informs this private entity, the Russians have penetrated your system, here's where they are. In some cases, the responses are, hey, want to work with you, that's great, thanks, can we come back? In some cases, it's, thanks very much, and we never hear anything. In some cases, it's, I don't believe you. In some cases, it's, that's not the role of the federal government. You saw this play out in, for example, some states' response to the election. Correct. That, and that's some what some states came back and said, hey, look, that's not your guy's role. And that's the testimony we've heard in a few hearings now. Yeah. So I'm highly concerned that if you don't have the authority or some aspect of the federal government doesn't have authority to say to a secretary of state, we recognize it is a state's right to run elections. We recognize that you choose the technology that you want to pursue. We recognize it's a state's rights issue. But if you don't have a, a, a level of sophistication that has been certified as cyber protected, um, it's not adequate. So what I really hope you can come to this committee with is a list of authorities you might need to put in place before the next election, because it's not adequate to defer this to any Secretary of State in any given state that they think they're covered. We need assurances that they are covered by the most highly sophisticated cyber ex experts in our government. And I think a lot of that cyber expertise is being developed by the Department of Defense. Yes, so I think I... Your, your leadership and coordination right. is so necessary. 
Yes, ma'am. So please, I don't dispute that at all. Much of what you're asking me, though, really falls in the Department of Homeland Security, and I don't want to speak for DHS, for, in, for you know, because Senator Kelly should, um, or excuse me, Secretary Kelly should be able to speak for himself. I do acknowledge, particularly if we were defined, to define this as critical infrastructure, then under the, hey, clearly DOD has a role here. Agreed. I mean, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Yes, ma'am. Um, with regard to the most recent French election, um, we saw that in that election, emails of the successful French candidate, Emmanuel Macron, were dumped online after previous <laughs> hacking. There was also rumor of campaigns launched against him on the internet, and the head of the German domestic intelligence agency accused Russia of hacking the Bundestag in preparation for Germany's upcoming presidential elections. Um, how can the United States leverage our cyber and other capabilities to prevent Russian interference in not only our elections, but those of allies and partners? And should we have a role? And what capabilities does Cybercom bring to the table to help deal with these type of threats? So this is much more in my role as the director of NSA than Cyber Command. Um, but if you take a look at the French elections, for example, again, an unclassified hearing, I'm not going to get into specifics. But we had become aware of Russian activity. We had talked to our French counterparts prior to the public announcements of the events that uh, were publicly attributed this past weekend and gave them a heads up. Look, we're watching the Russians. We're seeing them penetrate some of your infrastructure. Here's what we've seen. What can we do to try to assist? We're doing similar things with our German counterparts, with our British counterparts. They have an upcoming election sequence. We're all trying to figure out how can we try to learn from each other, and that's much more my NSA role than in my Cyber Command role. Thank you, Admiral. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral, for being here today. As you know, there's been some debate about our use of a geographically-based counterterrorism strategy, where legal authorities to conduct operations depends considerably on where they take place. To what extent are your operations in cyberspace similarly dependent upon the declared areas of active hostilities. So that, that is an issue for us. Authority is also granted, is often granted by a defined geographic space. Um, the, the point I try to make to policymakers is the challenge in the cyber arena, the infrastructure that, let's take ISIS, for example, that might, ISIS might be using is not necessarily physically in Syria and Iraq, but is in other areas. We need to be able to have an impact on that, and I apologize, I don't want to go into this broadly in unclassified form, but we have that challenge, yes, ma'am. Are you, are you bound, then, by the limitations that are set forward in the presidential policy guidance? Oh, yes, ma'am. I, I have to re meet and if, PPD 20, for so, example. So when you're looking at that, and, and we look at the interconnectedness of the nature of cyberspace, so what impact does that have on your operations. Do you, do you have the necessary ability to meet the requirements of the combatant commanders, the geographic combatant commanders? Not as fast as I would like. We have the, again, I'm not going to get into the specifics on an open forum, but some of the things we're doing against ISIS, this very issue came to a bit of a head. We were able to work it out through the interagency process, and we were granted the authorities to execute some of the ongoing activity that we're doing against ISIS that extends beyond the immediate physical environment of Syria and Iraq, but I'm the first to acknowledge it, it was not a, the fastest process in the world. Do we it was a very complete process. I'm the first to acknowledge that. Do you have suggestions for any changes that Congress needs to make in order for you to respond? B before to I go to Congress, I'm, I'm, try I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have a dialogue with my own bo immediate bosses about so what might such a framework look like, and I think I owe them time to come to their own conclusions first. And I understand that that presidential policy from 2013 is being reviewed by the department. Is that correct? Uh, it, again, it's not a department document. It, it's a presidential document. So, Is the department reviewing it? Uh, we are broadly looking at cyber authorities right now writ large. Um, again, I provided an input to the secretary with, hey, sir, here's my views on what are some of the things that we might want to look at. So Cybercom is involved in that review, and based on your experience, do you, where do you think improvements should be made? Well, the positive side for me is everything I'm hearing from the current team is they acknowledge that the structures that are in place are not fast enough. 
which is a, that's a good step for me because I'm not spending a lot of time in a debate. Now it's, okay, so what do we do? If you accept that premise, what should we do? Uh, again, because that's an ongoing topic of discussion, I would just rather not publicly get into this. I, I think I owe them the time for them to come to their conclusions, although they are reaching out to us. I, I have no complaints in that regard. Uh, do you anticipate that the secretary will be bringing uh, forward to this committee any conclusions that are made then? I, I don't know, ma'am. I don't want to speak for the secretary. Okay. Uh, Admiral, in testimony before the House Armed Services Committee in 2015, you mentioned an unresolved question about applying, quote, DOD-generated capacity in the cyber arena outside the government in the private sector. Mm. Uh, can you elaborate on this? About, uh, specifically, what type of uh, capacities do you believe would be beneficial, and what kind of gaps uh, are you trying to fill? So it goes to some of the points that many of you made already this morning about, for example, if we're going to defend critical infrastructure, if DOD is going to execute a mission to defend critical infrastructure, one of the points I'm trying to make is I don't want to show up in the middle of a crisis for the first time I've ever interacted with some of these sectors. That's just my experience as a military individual, individual teaches me discovery, le learning while you're moving to contact with an opponent is a painful way to learn. Increase loss, it takes so much more time and you're not effective and efficient. The argument I'm trying to make is building on the sector approach with, with, with critical infrastructure, which I think is very sound, can't we create standing mechanisms where I, the DOD, DHS, the private sector can operate 24 seven and operate with, hey, so what are we all seeing out there? Yeah, do you support the deployment of government sensing capabilities on the private sector? <laughs> In a perfect world, I what I would probably prefer would be could create a structure where the private sector could share the data, because they are putting sensors, putting telemetry on their networks couldn't you share that with us rather than us go in and do it? My first recommendation would be, couldn't we create a mechanism where we can take advantage of the investments and the capabilities the private sector is already making? Can we do that now? In some areas we do that now, but I, I want to make it much more institutionalized and much more real time for me anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First question, Admiral, for the record, uh, we've been having these hearings now for four years and we talk about the problem and everybody is absolutely convinced that this is a very serious problem. I would appreciate it given the fact of your, the depth of your knowledge and the work that you do, if you could supply for the record the five things you think we should do. Talking about it uh, is important, but action what 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 are the five, five actions if if you would think about it have some of your smart people think about it whether it's legislation or regulation or new relationships communication uh, I, I think all of us would find that helpful this is an echo of senator wicker's question earlier um, second it's often we talk about this we got to approach this with a whole of government approach mm -hmm. i really think the term should be whole of society, society. yes sir because this is an odd situation where you've got government for sure, but the vulnerable elements are in the private sector, the, the electric grid, the financial system, the, the gas pipeline system. And we, we had a, a situation, I think it was in 2011, where there was a cyber bill. It was regulatory. It would have applied to the private sector. It failed. Uh, there's res great resistance in the private sector to a regulatory approach. What about the idea, we, we don't ask the private sector to defend themselves against Russian bombs or, or uh, missile attacks or from North Korea. We do that. What about a system whereby we work with the private sector to assist them financially in installing the kind of defensive measures that might be important and in exchange they would get perhaps some limitation of liability uh, and of course they would get free stuff. The question is, how do we do that without them just taking their right. foot off the gas and not protecting them? I mean, certainly incentivizing behavior generally tends to produce better outcomes in our society than the penalization piece. Um, it's, it's a much broader issue than, than me, but I think the core point you raise, as I, the point I was trying to make with Senator Fisher, <laughs> we, traditionally in our society, we often have very strong walls between what is a private function and what's a government function. And I think cyber shows 
that much of what we're seeing is a national security issue, and therefore it requires a whole of nation approach to how we're going to handle this. Which involves new levels and creative thinking about how yes, to interface sir. between the government and the private sector, because we could have a perfect government system, but if the financial, if right. Wall Street goes down, it's going to be killed. No, I agree. Uh, on the issue of policy, Senator Rounds and I uh, supported an amendment that got into the National Defense Act last year uh, that essentially said to the administration, uh, 180 days, a report is due on military, non-military options available for uh, deterring and responding to uh, imminent threats. Uh, that date is coming, just to remind you. It's uh, June 23rd it's June, by my yes, calculation. Uh, and uh, this is a, a way of trying to force what Senator McCain is talking about, about the development of a cyber policy. And then the president has 180 days after that to describe actions carried out in cyberspace that may warrant a military response. We, we've got to get yes, through this. So I know OSD is working. They have the lead here. They will respond formally. We have been part of that process. Well, I'm, I'm just OSD delighted that lead. that's being worked on because I think one of our big gaps, talk about what do we need to do, a, a policy and a strategy, as the chairman has mentioned, is absolutely critical mm -hmm. because right now deterrence doesn't work unless there's a strategy and unless yes, people sir. know about it. Uh, finally, I think as we talk about this, if you think about what the Russians did in 2016, there were really three components. One was hacking and leaking. The other was attempted hacking in terms of the voting system, which we've talked about, which I think is a very serious issue. But the other is uh, uh, information uh, and, and the manipulation of right. information. That's very hard to get at, especially in a place that has the First Amendment. Right. I would suggest that one of the things we need to be thinking about, and this isn't necessarily in your jurisdiction, is uh, a heightened level of digital literacy in this country. People have to understand when they're being misled and manipulated, and perhaps they need to be given tips on how to do that. My, my wife has a sign in our kitchen that says, the, the, the most difficult thing on the Internet is to determine the authenticity of quotes, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but we've got to be educated. Our public has to understand that this is a whole new level of, of uh, way of manipulating them. There were all kinds of reports in, in the French elections that Macron had, had bank accounts in right. the Cayman Islands. It's not illegal to say he had them, but how do you defend themselves against that? And I just would urge you to be thinking about this. How do we educate our people to be uh, more discerning when they read something That's incredible sure. on the Internet? It's a brave new world out there in the information dynamic for all of us. And, it, and it's particularly challenging in a country that values free expression. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Rogers, um, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, wearing two hats, um, what is the earliest date that you think Cybercom should be elevated to a combatant command? Um, this criteria, would you share the criteria? I, I, this is an ongoing policy issue, so I'm not going to get into the specifics. I think that's not fair to my bosses. My input has been this is something I think we can do in a reasonably short period of time, make the initial steps. A set of uh, criteria that you would expect to be completed before such a move was made? We've identified the steps within the department. We've identified the steps that we would need to take to elevate to a combatant command. So, again, this is why I say I'm, I'm confident we could do this in a very could, short Could you share with the committee a little bit in terms of what some of those time. activities have to be? <laughs> We've identified um, we need to shift current responsibilities from strat STRATCOM down to us. We need to make changes to the unified command plan, which is a document signed by the President of the United States. It's the formal document that actually outlines what combatant commanders exist, what their defined responsibilities are, if there's a geographic aspect to those responsibilities. We've, we've got to make those changes. It's not, and then we've identified investments in manpower as well. There would be an advantage in some ways to having two separate uh, organizations. And while the information that would be shared perhaps would be shared in a different manner, the sharing of that information could continue on, but the activities of the two would be different. Could you share a little bit about the positive side of making a move like that? So I've, I'm on record as saying that my recommendation to this process has been that 
and I didn't believe this when I came into the job, but after about six to nine months, I came to the conclusion, being in the two jobs, the right answer in the long term is to separate the two. They'll still remain closely aligned because Cyber Command and NSA will still continue to work in the, in the same battle space in many ways, so to speak. So it will still be a unique relationship. But in the long run, I think it's the right thing to do. I've also said, look, there's a series of steps we need to take to make sure that each organization, as it shifts from the structure we originally created, is optimized to continue to achieve successful outcomes. Or others, there are some things we need to do, particularly on the cyber command side. But it is all within reason to me. It can be done within a reasonable period of time and a reasonable level of investment. How do you classify the um, private sector critical infrastructure that's vital to the DOD mission, and what efforts is Cybercom undertaking to protect private sector critical infrastructure that is vital to the DOD mission? No, I'm not talking about trying to classify all the other stuff, but no, no, I understand. just the items that are, that, that are critical to DOD activity. So we try to partner closely with the Defense Security Service um, and the Defense Cyber Crime Center to make sure that those critical businesses and infrastructure that we, the DOD, count on have access to information. Boy, the transcom commander and I spent a lot of time focused on this. How do we make sure that, because he in particular, his organization, not that it's unique to transcom, but it's probably at a greater level where their mission execution day to day is so dependent on capabilities resonant in the private sector. He's probably got a greater challenge here than most. We're, we're talking about how can we speed up processes? I'd like to see over time can we create a different relationship? It's hard right now to deal direct because of the law and the, and the framework we've created over time. I'd like to see if we could potentially look at how we might amend that so we could deal more directly with a specific set of companies that have a direct relationship or provide a unique set of capabilities or infrastructure for DOD. I'm, I'm working that with um, Transcom. We've also picked in a couple places Hawaii and Guam, for example, that are a little more isolated where it's a little easier, a couple test cases on how we can partner between the DOD and critical infrastructure on the islands, power and a few other things to, to highlight how do we work together very closely because there's no alternative generator capability, for example, off island that we're going to pipe in power. If we have problems with the power on the island distribution system, we got major problems for DOD. I think sometimes we forget just how critical hmm. the cyber aspects are. And when we talk about the different domains that we fight in, sure. air, land, sea, space, and cyber, can you think of any of the other uh, areas that we require dominancy of that we would maintain dominancy in if we don't have dominancy in cyber? No, it's one of the comments I made in my verbal opening statement. <laughs> we not only... Um, are our own mission set, so to speak, but our success helps to underpin the ability of the rest of the department. I'm not saying it's the only determinant, but it's a foundational element of the department's broader ability to execute its mission sets across the breadth of DOD missions. Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome back, Admiral Rogers. Hey, um, it has become really evident to me as a member of both the Intel Committee and this committee um, it's become crystal clear that Russia has really mastered this domain of digital disinformation mm -hmm. and that they've effectively set up a situation where they're coordinating paid trolls, um, fake automated social media accounts, bots as they call them, and state-backed news outlets to really amplify stories right. very effectively that serve their interests. And that's true of what we would call fake news. It's also true of any real news that simply serves their interest or undermines uh, U.S. policy. So these capabilities are proving to be just as politically disruptive, both in our elections and day-to-day -day business, um, as well as what we've seen in Europe as the Russian hacking that we've seen. So does Cyber Command have a role to play in, in meeting this th new, what, what I would describe as a threat, not just a reality? Or do you see it as wholly outside your lane? I wouldn't say it's wholly outside. There, there's a broader issue here to me, and information is one aspect of it. If you look at, for example, the way the spectrum and the network world are converging, if you look at the way the information dynamic is playing out, 
One of the questions that we are trying to come to grips with broadly within the department, although I'll be the first to admit I'm so focused right now on trying to execute the missions I've been assigned, part of my input to this process has been let me get the structure set before we start throwing more stuff on the life raft. But I'm, I'm trying to conceptualize on my own mind, so how are we going to bring together electronic warfare, cyber, and the information dynamic? Because it is all blurring in this digital world that we're living in. And how do we do this in an integrated way? And right now, we're not there yet. We're still trying to figure out what's the right way forward. Do you have people assigned to look at, for example, just the, the issue of when you have thousands and thousands of bots out there and they, they serve as a forcing mechanism, uh, they look like social media accounts in is Wisconsin or Michigan or somewhere else in the United States, but they're really just automated accounts that take a story that has interested 10 people and makes it look like it's... Right of interest to 10,000, suddenly it's on my social media feed on, or, or my news feed on my, my iPhone. Have we looked at capabilities for simply making it clear, even to the companies that, whose platforms those are on, that those accounts are not genuine accounts? Because it seems to me if you take that amplification piece out, even if it's a, on a constant rolling mm -hmm. basis, you, you would have a dramatically diminished impact from this. Yes, although a couple points if I could. First, remember much of the scenario you just went through is about domestic, and both as NSA and Cyber Command, we're focused largely, NSA we're focused externally, Cyber Command we're largely focused externally. So I'll monitor bots, infrastructure, external to the United States. When it comes to... Well, the bot to, farms typically are overseas. However, they're check, appearing to but, be right, domestic when you, accounts. When you start to but they're not a, a, attached to actual people in the United States. So, But one of the phenomena we're starting to see is you're starting to see a migration of capability from the external infrastructure that we have been aware of and observing for some period of time. The way this is going to go next, in my opinion, you're going to start to see this in domestic manipulation. Um, and that is a part that for us right now, no, I'm not really directly involved in. We do, as part of the broader government effort, participate in generating insight that we share with major social media providers to say, hey, this is activity that we're seeing that we believe to be false or that we believe to be criminal or we believe to be supporting of you know, particular groups that are a threat to the nation. So you're actually able in, in relatively real time to share information with, with big social media providers? When in the some cases, and I wouldn't argue that it is necessarily immediate real time, because one of the things that I try to do is kind of get a critical center, get enough that I can try to show them a, a comprehensive effort here as opposed to coming to them with, hey, here, here's the count today, here's 10 the next hour, here's, I'm trying to, because we're in the early stages of this. I'm trying to engender a broader dialogue about, look, there's something systematic here that we've, both of us, have got to be looking at. We've got to stop I, looking I, at this one individual. Exactly. Service. And I think it speaks to the relationship you were talking about, whether you're talking about the financial services sector, the utilities sector, or, in right. this case, social media and media. Um, we need to have those relationships in place to be much more responsive than we currently are. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Rogers. It's, it's good to see you again. Uh, during Senator Fisher's line of questioning, you had answered that you don't want to show up in the middle of a conflict. You don't want to have to learn about the enemy on the move. And I, I agree. And I would also say that, conversely, we also want to know about our friendlies, and we don't want to learn about them on the move either. So um, going back to the National Guard, we've corresponded back and forth right. a number of times, and uh, we want to make sure that that you know about those friendlies and the capabilities that they, they bring into your organization should they ever be needed. So uh, I did drop a bill earlier this year to ensure that DOD will start tracking these capabilities. But from your, for, from your perspective, what more can we be doing um, to help CyberCom connect with our National Guard and their capabilities. What else can we right. do? So I feel pretty good about knowledge and awareness. I mean, I never thought as a commander, but I, you know, walk you through what Kansas is doing, Pennsylvania is doing, Delaware, Virginia, Washington, California. Again, I, it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting to me. I think to myself, wow, Rogers, you're in a very different world here. Um, <laughs> the, the biggest challenge that I'm still trying to work, and it's one of I've outlined about six different priorities for Cyber Command for calendar year 17. I said, hey, these are six things we're going to focus on. One of the six 
is about creating a model for reserve and guard integration. Mm. So I'm trying to partner with Northern Command as well as um, the National Guard Bureau, General Engel and his mm. team about, okay, so we're seeing the investments that the Guard and the Reserve is making, which I'm very supportive of and appreciative of. Now, how do we create the mechanisms so we can actually apply that in real time. We're doing some things now, for example, where Air Force is activating, and in fact, I've reviewed the activation sequence in the Guard out to fiscal year 20. For the Guard units, we're gonna bring on an active status to meet the requirements that the Air Force has for the cyber mission force that I command, I lead. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is, if we have a major cyber event, I feel very comfortable about we understand who's gonna do what. What I'm curious about is what happens if it's not something catastrophic, if it's not something that necessarily trips a threshold where the DOD active force is viewed as the primary responsibility, but how do we use those guard and reserve capabilities in instances where the active side isn't necessarily gonna be the lead? How do we make sure the capabilities are there? How do we apply them? What's the command and control structure that's in place? We, we do that now in terms of defense support to civil authorities. That's very mature in terms right. of how we respond to natural disasters. Mm -hmm. We've got a great process there, support to FEMA, the North Command, Northern Command's role. I'm trying to argue we got to spend a little more time on the cyber piece of this. Absolutely. I would agree. We're into this. I would agree wholeheartedly. I, <clears throat> I look at it, maybe it runs parallel to our civil support teams where they provide um, backup in case of any sort of incident at the Super Bowl and things like that. We always have them on standby. And as we look at major events and progression, whether it's elections or other significant events uh, throughout the year, we have those, those guard capabilities. Right. Can on I make one other point? Well. I apologize. Yes, sir. I didn't mean to interrupt. One of the other challenges in the guard construct, the guard's construct is a geographic construct based on state. Yes. And so one of the challenges, I'm, again, I'm trying to work my, my mind through, and I have this discussion with the Council of Governors and the TAGs, in many instances, the infrastructure that a state is going to be counting on from a cyber perspective in the cyber arena doesn't necessarily physically reside in the state. So how do we take advantage of the guard structure more mm -hmm. broadly and not just, not, I'm not saying that the state piece isn't important, but I'm trying to figure how do we overlay a largely geographic and state-defined construct on something that is not always defined by immediate geography, if, if that makes sense. It does make sense. It absolutely does make sense. And I know a number of my colleagues, moving on to a different topic, have talked about personnel and, and how do we keep personnel there. So there's been a lot of suggestions about bringing civilians in to fill in the gaps. Um, but... Uh, during Secretary Mattis's confirmation, he also stated that the warrior ethos is not a luxury, it is essential when you have a military. And as we look at things like lateral accessions and flexible career paths, how do we make sure that warrior ethos isn't being diluted? No, I'm the first to admit, it's one reason why I've argued be leery of creating a cyber force that is predominantly civilian. No disrespect to my civilian teammates, but we want the warrior ethos and culture. Secondly, under the law of armed conflict, there are things legally that a uniformed military member of a nation state can do that a civilian cannot within a legal framework. So civilians play an important role here, don't get me wrong. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that the right construct for us is to bring the total spectrum, active, guard, reserve, contractor, civilian, private sector. It's our ability to bring it all together, not one single slice. So I'd be leery about swinging the pendulum too far in one direction, away from the, the military piece of that. Thank you for laying that out. I appreciate your time, Admiral Rogers. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence released an intelligence community assessment on Russian activities and in, in intentions in recent U.S. elections, and General Clapper testified uh, regarding this report yesterday in the Senate, sub, uh, in the Judiciary Subcommittee. So we, we all know that uh, Russia interfered with our elections. So uh, do you view President Putin's actions in this regard as a cyber attack? Uh, again, ma'am, that's a legal and a policy discussion. My point is it's un it should be viewed as unacceptable. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line to me. This is not a behavior we want to encourage. This is not a behavior we want to accept, nor is this a behavior I think we want to see repeated. 
I think we all share that how to get there is, uh, is the challenge. What is your opinion of the role of the military and intelligence agencies in preventing these types of events in the future? So first, from an intelligence perspective, our job, speaking as the director of NSA, our job is to generate insights and knowledge that help informed potential response and the ability also, if we can get ahead of the problem, to identify it in advance, intent, a nation or actor's intent to do something, that that then arms policymakers and military commanders with the ability to engage in operations or choices that clearly communicate to that other party, hey, we know what you're thinking about doing, you don't want to go down this road. On the cyber command side, again, if we define election infrastructure as critical infrastructure to the nation and we're directed by the president or the secretary, I can apply our capabilities in partnership with others because we won't be the only ones, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, I can apply those capabilities proactively with some of the owners of these systems. It was very clear by General Clapper yesterday that Russia will continue these efforts. And in fact, we know that they've been doing this since the 1960s or 70s, but it's just that they have many more tools yeah. in their toolbox to interfere with our elections. So uh, you're still awaiting direction from the president for everyone to coordinate their efforts to, uh, to stop this kind no, of I'm saying on Russia's part? I, have not, I don't have a defined mission here. No one has changed that yet. We need to do that for everybody to come together. Thank you. Um, the, the services continue to increase cybersecurity capabilities and develop advanced tools to combat cyber attacks. And PACOM has placed a focus on advanced cyber and anti-satellite capabilities. How does CyberCom work with the other combatant commands like PACOM to counter the cyber threats they face? So I partner with, um, I was just in Honolulu two weeks ago with Admiral Harris and his team sitting down going, hey, because I try to get out there about every, for example, Hawaii, just an example. I'm there generally every six months. I try to do this with all the combatant commanders everywhere around the world, sit down face to face with where are we? Are we meeting your requirements? Cyber Command in many ways, much of what we do functions to support others. We exist to support and enable the success of others. So I always tell our team, much of our success is going to be defined by others, not by us, and that's the way it should be. And so we spend a good deal of time aligning capability to meet specific combatant commander requirements, working with the combatant commanders as to what should be the priority for how those capabilities are applied. In many instances, I want them to set the priority, not me. I have an opinion and we'll partner together. Um, and so, for example, that's what we're doing now in the, in the Pacific from both a defensive and an offensive side. And, and in your meetings with the other combatant commands, then, is part of your function to um, encourage, uh, uh, to make sure that we don't have unnecessary duplication of effort across the services? Right. So I, I try to make the argument cyber is a high demand, low density capability, just like ISR, just like soft, just like ballistic missile defense. And therefore, the same kinds of processes that we put in place to make sure we're maximizing the finite capability we have, we've got to do the exact same thing in cyber. So, uh, we know that we have challenges facing military recruiters in attempting to mm -hmm. fill their cyber-related billets. Um, and other, as other government agencies and the private sector try to fill their requirements as well, uh, I'd like to know what specifically, how important is it to continue non-military federal investments in education, particularly in the STEM programs for American youth in order to meet the growing need of, of uh, Cyber Command and other... Right, so as I said, our workforce is going to be a spectrum from the active, the Guard, Reserve, civilian, and contractors. For the civilian contractor and much of that active piece, much of this education is going to be done by the private sector, yes. not by the government. So it's one reason why, as I said, we have relationships with over two, my memory's right, over 200 academic institutions. It's one reason why I spend a fair amount of time as a senior commander going to universities around the United States about, so how are we going to create the human capital of the future in this? It's one reason why I spend a lot of time talking to the private sector about, so tell me how you generate a workforce. How do you retain it? I acknowledge that there are some differences but are there some things I could learn from you about what works for you? Because it can't be all about money. Thank you for that proactive uh, posture. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Admiral Rogers, it's good to see you again. You've been on the job about two years, right? Three years, sir. Three. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, if you were to, to 
go back three years ago, and you were in the same committee hearing, would the answers have changed substantially in terms of our current where, in other words, have we made significant progress? Boy, where we've made significant process, progress, we have capability. We're actually using it. We've got a good way ahead. We've got a commitment to that way ahead. The challenge now, so that's what I would have said as we look. But if you, if, as you go through this, Admiral, if, if you think about uh, looking at our near-peer competitors, uh, they two or three years further along. Right. So is the gap narrower or wider now uh, between our capabilities to defend ourselves and to potentially uh, respond to some of attack? Narrowing. The gap's narrowing. It's narrowing. But the, to go continue what I think was the point you're trying to make, but I would also tell myself, Rogers, you're not moving fast enough. <laughs> We've got to move faster. We've got to prioritize. I'm the first to acknowledge that we are not where I want to be. What about over the last three years, the sense of ownership in the private sector? I, I for one, think that we're making a huge mistake if we leave this hearing or if the private sector thinks we're coming up with a solution that right. they all benefit from. They're a part of, a, of, a, uh, of an infrastructure that we cannot possibly be expected to... Uh, yeah, this is sort of like we we want you know we are the police. Back to Senator uh, King's uh, point, uh, we have to respond when an attack occurs to try and figure out who did it and what the consequences should be. Uh, but we all need to have some sort of security ourselves in our businesses and our homes and our states. How well have they really improved over the last three years since you've been in this? It's country? uneven by sector. Some sectors. Boy, I've really made significant improvement. Others know. T to go to your point, the analogy I try to use, look, it's hard to expect the police force to stop burglaries if you're going to leave every one of your doors not just unlocked but open. You're going to turn all the lights on, and you're going to leave the house for extended and, periods and of time. And a sign saying not home. And just say, right, hey, feel free. I, it, it, that's not going to get us where we need to well, be. Well, how do we move the ball? We had, a, we had Transcom in here uh, for a hearing um, just last week or week right. before, and um, how do we actually get to a point to where we put pressure on the private sector, not to mandate, uh, but to maybe use it as a distinguishing factor when we're choosing between one potential contractor or supplier and another one in terms of the extent to which we believe that they're fully protected or is protected as much as they can be in this space. So I think it goes to a combination of we need to change the basic contract language about and set minimum expectations if you want to do business with the DOD. Is that again, within that's, your that's current illegal. authorities? I'm sorry, sir? Is that within current authorities? Or yes, there, and we have made some across the department. We've made some changes in contractual language, but I think the evolution has shown us we've got to be more so, specific. To what extent is your command trying to define? We, we, in the discussion, I think it was with Transcom, we, we were talking about needing some sort of third-party verification. There, there needs to be something out there that makes sure that our suppliers, maybe even right. state agencies, are adhering to some baseline uh, standards. Uh, to what extent is your command involved in that, or, or who owns that? So we don't do that right now, but that's one of those things, that, that's one of those changes I talked about. How do we change the relationship between DOD and its core private capability providers, infrastructure providers? You know, perhaps one of the things contractually you look at is, so if you want to do business with us, with us you're signing up to potentially to the idea that we can do an assessment. We can do an inspection. Um, I mean... You know, I think don't get me wrong, we need to work our way through that, but that's the kind of thing I think we need to be thinking about. I think about. it's critically important. We have to also look at the reality that they've got a supplier base that the people that we contract with need to make sure they're holding their supplier right. base up to the same standard, or I'll just repeat what I always say in these committees. Uh, you can find a weaker link. All yes, you need sir. to do is understand the supply chain and go after that one critical, seemingly innocuous component that shuts down a, right. uh, your ability to to repair a grid component or to repair uh, some weapon in the supply chain. In my remaining time, can you uh, tell me a little, a after elevation and the dual hat split, uh, how do you envision a standalone operate, a command operating, and, and what are the priorities? Well, again, now we're into a kind of what-if scenario, so I'd rather not go down. I just don't like getting into, you know, what-if kinds of things. That, that decision hasn't been made. That's a broader policy issue. I, I've had the opportunity to provide input to that process, but now we need to let the process play out and see what, this, what kind of bottom line the decision makers come to. I just think that's fair. That's what we owe them. Thank you. Sir. On behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Warren, please. Thank you. 
Uh, I want to quickly ask about the importance of our non-military agencies and programs to your mission, which includes defending the United States against cyber attacks by foreign and non-state actors. Our State Department promotes international norms of responsible behavior in cyberspace, and it helps make our partners mm -hmm. and allies more cyber secure. I think you've already talked about that some and counters online radicalization and recruitment by non-state actors like ISIS every day. So, Admiral Rogers, you lead the best cyber warriors in the world. I want to ask, would reductions in funding to the State Department's cybersecurity and counter-radicalization programs make your job easier or harder? Tougher. That's, I agree. I am concerned about the significant reductions to non-DOD departments proposed by the administration. These agencies provide critical support for your work, and I just want to make sure that doesn't get overlooked. What I also want to do is follow up on a question that Senator Hirono asked. Last year, the Russians stole private emails and splattered them all across the Internet to help their preferred American presidential candidate. Last week, the Russians did exactly the same thing in order to uh, help their preferred French presidential candidate. The United States of America needs to step up its game here, and I know that you are a key part of that. Now, you stated in your prepared testimony, Admiral, that improving DOD's network defenses and building a cybersecurity culture depend on skilled people. So I'd like to press you on the question mm -hmm. of how we recruit and retain cyber warriors. Admiral, you lead... Um, let me see if I, can, if I can do this the right way. We had a, a hearing recently in our military personnel subcommittee, and one of the witnesses said that the military recruiting system is so focused on filling quotas that they end up recruiting only for the military of today, not targeting the best suited to execute the missions that we're going to need a decade from now. So, Admiral, can you tell us about your recommendations to ensure that we're recruiting the right talent for the cyber jobs and threats right. that we will face tomorrow? So my experience to date, when I knock on wood, um, has been I'm very happy with the quality of individuals I we're understand. receiving. Um, we're exceeding retention broadly uh, on the uniform side. I've got a little more concern on the civilian side actually right now in terms of retention, mm -hmm. um, particularly on the NSA side of my responsibilities. The thing that's helping us at the moment is this workforce views themselves as the digital warriors of the 21st century yes. and their self image is we are the cutting edge of something brand new and every day we are shaping the future in a way that nobody else gets to do. And we're doing things that nobody else on the outside gets to do. And they're powered by the mission and I'm not going to pretend their leadership's perfect but my sense is they think we got a focus, we got a vision and we're driving. So I'm constantly, as a leader, looking for what are the indicators that that's changing? How do I get ahead of this? And then what are the skill sets that I need, not today, but maybe two years from now, maybe five years from now? Um, data is one area I would highlight. I'm, I'm sitting there saying to myself right now, we're probably not optimized for the data requirements of the near term, so what kind of data skills do I need? Is that a uniform skill? Do I look at civilians to do that? Would a contractor make more sense? Is that something that the reserves could do because they can put people in a skill set and then, boy, they're going to stay there and do that? That's probably an example of where I'm saying to myself, maybe we need to be looking at... I, it's still just in my mind, I, we have not developed a formal plan, so to speak. So, but I'm glad to hear you're looking out. I, I love the focus on data, you know, critically important here. In the 2017 Defense Department authorization, we gave a lot of flexibility in how to recruit talent right. specifically. So let me just ask, do you have all the authorities you need or do we need... More exemptions, for example, from federal hiring laws and other changes in the system to help you in your recruiting efforts, not just today, but six right. months from today and a year from today and a few years from today. For right now, I feel good about military recruitment. I find our ability to hire on the civilian side, we're lagging. This is, I've got to come up, and part of this is I tell our team, is this something we're failing to understand? Do we have a lack of knowledge of our own system that we're not optimizing this system to generate the outputs we need? I'm not at a stage yet where I've decided the answer is I have to go ask for more authority, but I've told the team, look, if, if we come to the conclusion that we have to ask for more authority, guys, that's what we're doing. Okay. Well, We've got to take advantage of the willingness of this committee, the department, 
to work with us when it comes to flexibility in the human capital piece. Good. You know, the, I know how much uh, you have invested in our cyber military force and uh, the mission force overall, and that you've made enormous progress. But I do hope you will let us know. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and let us know more in advance rather than later. It takes a little while to get right. things through around here. Uh, but let us know, because yes, if you need more flexibility, you should have more flexibility. Thank, Thank you. you, Admiral. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Admiral, good to see you again. Thank you for everything. Um, sure. In testimony we heard earlier this year, Defense Science Board said, and I quote, for at least the next decade, the offensive cyber capabilities of our most capable adversaries are likely to far exceed the United States' ability to defend key critical infrastructures. Do you agree with that uh, from the Defense Science Board? I, I, I said broadly, clearly things favor the offensive side. Part of our challenge is much of our infrastructure rep represents investments and decisions and priorities made decades ago, and they're not reflective of the digital world we find ourselves in today. And the cost of replacing that fixed infrastructure is huge. And so it's not likely that we're gonna replace all of that infrastructure in the immediate near term. It's just the scale is just beyond the ability of our society, our nation right now. In so some we're ways. primarily focused on, on defense, deterrence, um, and detection right now from your earlier testimony, even today in this written testimony. My question is, in open hearing like this, can you, is there anything you can tell us about what we're doing on the offensive side? Are we, are we developing offensive capabilities as right. well? So we have acknowledged that we are developing offensive capabilities. We have acknowledged that we are employing those capabilities in the fight against ISIS. I apologize. I'd just rather not get into the specifics of that. But I'd, I'd like to move over to the, the question of the day, and that is how do, you, how do you stand up this force over the next few years? And training is a, is a very major part of this, as you've said. Between 2013 and 16, uh, under Cybercom supervision, the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff were supposed to come to an agreement on a joint federated training program funded by the services for the training of cyber mission force. Uh, can you update us on the status of that agreement and where we stand today on that? So we'll, we'll transition to that model in 18, the, the initial outfit, if you will, of the cyber mission force Using much of NSA's infrastructure, we signed up, speaking now as the director of NSA, to use much of NSA's structure, our schoolhouses, our National Cryptologic School, for example, to do much, not all, but to do much of the training associated with the initial build-out of the mission force. That build-out full operating capability is due to be completed, and we are on track for 30 September 2018. The agreement then was at that point responsibility for training and development long-term sustainment of the force would transition to a service structure. We're on track to do that right now. So um, does that mean that each service would be responsible for developing their own cyber warriors? So what happens is we have a mandated training standard by position. Each, sta each service then oftentimes partnering. For example, right now there's Navy training in Pensacola that all the services use, for example, because we all then get together and say, so given this single common standard, given this single agreed to qualification process, what's the best way across the department to make this work? What service has the best capacity, best capability? How do we manage throughput broadly? That's the only way to maximize this. Can you talk about, you mentioned context earlier, which is why you don't favor a unified force. Right. So can you a talk about integrated the, understand, cyber understand. I, I, I get it. So having some experience in large organizations, I'm concerned about that trade-off. There's a balance. Right. right. Yes, sir. We're in, a, we're in a crisis stage right now. I think you would agree with that with regard to our ability to detect and deter at this point. I understand long term, the ideal might be to have the service because of the con context uh, dimension. In the interim phase when we're in this crisis mode though, do we have a sense that um, that, that might be counterproductive to our ability to, to stand up to the immediate threats? It would, be, it would be difficult to do it today in a short term. That would take a long term investment, significant structural, cultural changes. It's another reason why I would argue optimize the structures and the mechanisms that are in place. Now, we also got to hold them accountable. Don't get me wrong. You, you just can't turn to them and say, well, just do what you always do. There has to be accountability and oversight. Um, but I'm comfortable that the current approach is going to generate the outcomes we need, even as I acknowledge it is not moving as fast as I would like. And we got a huge mismatch between current capacity and capability and what I know is the requirement. We're always in a tail chase. You mentioned earlier that the history has been the extraction of data from the system, that mm -hmm. hacking is the primary motive from Russia and China, primarily state actors, has been the extraction of data. 
In North Korea, we saw a little bit of a different attack right. where they went in and actually started placing uh, what I would call a sleeper embedded code, whatever, for a bigger mega event later. Do we see a continuing growth in that type of activity? Have we seen any evidence of that in the U.S.? Oh, you do. You see every nation state engage. They'll penetrate a system. They will look to st- not just extract, but study it, understand it, see where it connects to. Can they use this as a jumping off point to get to somewhere else? Um, one of the things we're always looking for is, so if a system has been penetrated, has the actor manipulated, changed, amended the configuration so they can gain access separately now? That's one of the key things we always look for when we're trying to do um, mitigation once someone has penetrated a system. So it's the full spectrum. That simple answer is yes, it's the full spectrum. Have we why. seen any in the U.S., any evidence of that in the U.S.? I've seen nation states engaged in activity in the U.S. where they clearly are interested in a long-term presence, not Thank just you. extracting data. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Admiral Rogers, always a pleasure uh, sure. to see you and uh, enjoy your testimony, uh, as always. Uh, my question re- uh, involves uh, the U.S. semiconductor industry, which mm-hmm. uh, right now faces uh, some, some major challenges. In addition to some fundamental technological limits that are being reached uh, in that area, there's also been a Concerted strategic push by China to reshape the market in its favor using industrial policies backed by over $100 billion uh, Mm -hmm. in uh, government-directed funds. And with uh, semiconductor technology critical to the operation of of critical U.S. defense systems, I'm very concerned that China's industrial policies uh, pose a, a real threat to U.S. national security. And although we have a range of tools, which you're very familiar with, uh, to, uh, to deal with this, the principal mechanism to manage it is the Interagency Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., or CFIUS. CFIUS. And uh, within the DOD, uh, as you know as well, NSA is a key contributor to CFIUS National Security Assessment. DIA, the military services, the combat commands all have a role uh, in this process as well. But my uh, question is, considering uh, Cybercom's leading role uh, within the department, how is the command postured to support the CFIUS process for potential foreign mergers and acquisitions that have perhaps significant uh, implications Mm -hmm. for the DOD cyber mission? So we predominantly interact in the CFIUS process on the NSA side, but one of the implications I think for the future, and um, again, it's just one input I've tried to make to the new team is, I think we need to step back and reassess the CFIUS process and make sure it's optimized for the world of today and tomorrow. Because I'm watching nation states generate insight and knowledge about our processes. They understand our CFIUS structure. They understand the criteria broadly that we use to make broader policy decisions about is an investment acceptable from a national security perspective. And my concern is you're watching some nation states change their methodology to, to try to get around this process. Well, do you, uh, do you feel that CFIUS is adequately resourced uh, and uh, authorized uh, to make the kinds of changes that you think we need? I can't say that. I'm, I'm not smart enough because we we're just one element in this process, and it's not something that the DOD writ large or Cyber Commander NSA runs per se, but I do think we need to step back and ask that kind of question to ourselves. Yeah. Just my gut just tells me that that's what we need to be doing, one of the things we need to be doing. I'd like to turn back to uh, some of the discussions that uh, we have had related to uh, the involvement of the private sector, which has to be intimately involved in any kind of uh, security operations. And I know your teams uh, have uh, operated cyber guards uh, over the the year's exercises. uh, And the most recent one, you were involved in simulating an attack on the Northeast, attacks on Gulf oil facilities, uh, ports across California. Uh, All of these entities, of course, are... uh, are uh, not uh, are privately owned, uh, not part of the Department of Defense. And a recent GAO study uh, looking at some of the prior exercises cited concerns that large portions of the exercise take place in a classified forum, uh, which places some inherent limitations on public and private sector participation. And although the arrangement certainly uh, is uh, designed to protect sensitive plans and capabilities, and we all fully realize the importance uh, of doing that, The approach also may fall uh, short in preparing participants uh, for a real-world cyber emergency, which potentially could be catastrophic. So my question is, how are you balancing the need uh, for security with with the realities of a cyber threat landscape that may ultimately necessitate very broad support from uh, uncleared uh, citizens uh, and entities? So it's one of the reasons we've changed the structure of CyberGuard over time and tried to bring more in the private sector. So if you look at 
the scenario that you talked about that we did last year in terms of we did, we simulated activity directed against the power grid in the east, um, petroleum industry in the Gulf, and port sectors on the west coast. We went to several private companies within each of those sectors and said, hey, we would like you to participate in this. What do we need to make that happen? Um, we also increasingly are going to the private sector in terms of private sectors, companies that run the infrastructure associated with supporting those entities. We've added that to the cyber guard arena. So I'm trying to see, can we create a, a, an exercise in addition? We do tabletop exercises, which are not quite, you know, you actually get a cyber guard is huge. It's like a thousand individuals. Um, we also do regular tabletop exercises where we talk at a high level so we can skirt some of the security aspects of the classification aspects of this um, and bring in the private sector to that. We do that out at the Fort Meade complex several times a year separately from CyberGuard. Great. Thank you, Admiral. <clears throat> Thank you, Admiral Rogers. Welcome back. Sir. A lot of talk about Russia today and uh, how they hacked into those emails and released them last year. I want to touch on that. Uh, specifically, Senator Warren, a few moments ago, continued to refer to the president as Russia's preferred candidate. I think she's referring there to the intelligence community assessment of January 6th, primarily uh, written by your agency, the NSA, along with the CIA and FBI. Mm -hmm. This brings to mind a curiosity uh, from the report that I wanted to raise with you and ask about. Uh, in the key judgments, Report says, we also assess Putin and the Russian government aspired to help President-elect Trump's election chances when possible by discrediting Secretary Clinton and publicly contrasting her unfavorably to him. All three agencies agree with this judgment. CIA and FBI have high confidence in this judgment. NSA has moderate confidence. Could you explain the discrepancy for us in your level? Of uh, I wouldn't call it a discrepancy. I'd call it an honest difference of opinion between three different organizations. And in the end, I made that call. So if anybody's unhappy, Mike Rogers is the accountable individual. When I looked at all the data, I was struck by, for every other key judgment in the report, I had multiple sources, multiple disciplines, and I was able to, review, I was able to remove almost every other alternative rationale I could come up with in my mind for, well, could there be another reason to explain this? In the case of that one particular point, it didn't have the same level of sourcing and the same level of, of multiple sources from different perspectives, you know, human intelligence, signals intelligence. I still believe that it made sense. I still believe that it fit within the context, and I still agreed with the judgment. But I did say from a professional analytic perspective, I'm not quite at the same confidence level as you were as my two counterparts in the form of John Brennan and Jim Comey. The one particular point being going from saying Russia wanted to hurt Secretary Clinton's chances, in addition, help Donald Trump's chances. Correct. Uh, those are hard to disentangle, right, since in our election system we have a first past the post as long as you don't have a In this case, there candidate. was some pretty specific intelligence that seemed to differentiate, that there was specific thoughts on the part of the Russians on each of the aspects of, of that statement, if you will. Uh, obviously, we can't discuss those right, yes, classified matters, uh, but there's a lot of open source matters as well. Uh, President Trump, for instance, was the candidate who wanted to build up our defenses, expand our missile defenses, accelerate nuclear modernization, pump more North American oil and gas. None of those things seem to be very favorable to the Kremlin. Did uh, your agency take those things into account? Yes, sir. Um, and also, if you look back over the last eight years, just a quick rundown of what I could recall. I'm sure I'm missing some. The Obama administration in 2009 reset relations with Russia six months after it invaded Georgia. 2010 signed New START, which I would say was a better treaty from Russia than us. 2012, in a hot mic moment with Dmitry Medvedev, President Obama said he had had more flexibility on ballistic missile defense after his election. He also mocked his opponent at a presidential debate, saying that Russia was our number one geopolitical foe. 2013 was the red line fiasco in Syria with Russia's closest Middle East ally uh, when President Obama accepted Vladimir Putin's offer to remove chemical weapons from Syria, which we now know uh, was a failed effort. 2014, we stood largely idly by during the Crimea invasion and did not offer defensive weapons when Russian-backed separatists started fighting in the Donbas, despite bipartisan support from this committee. 
Uh, by that point, we had long since been ignoring INF treaty violations that our military now acknowledges. 2015, Russia had a massive surge into Syria and continued its effort to block UN Security Council resolutions. 2016, they pummeled Aleppo into submission. Uh, in private, they objected to numerous provisions that I wrote in the Intelligence Authorization Act that would hold Russia to account in its espionage effort, and they increased the amount of times they were buzzing aircraft and warships in Europe and the Arctic. President Trump promised to reverse those policies. President Secretary Clinton largely campaigned on con continuity. That doesn't sound to me like something that the Kremlin would be happy about. I'm just going by the intelligence. It was very clear the intelligence of the Russians' perceptions. Do you common. think, given that eight year history of the Obama administration, that Russian intelligence and leadership felt emboldened to undertake? the hacks of those email systems and release them? Now you're into political judgment, sir, and that's just not my area. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up, Admiral Rogers, sure. uh, on this issue of moderate confidence, w did you have a high degree of confidence that there was an effort to, to discredit one candidate and only a moderate degree of confidence that there is an effort to support. If you read the key judgments, what it says is I concurred in the report in the sense that we had high confidence in the judgment that the Russians clearly were trying to undermine our democracy right. and discredit us broadly. Generally. That they wanted uh, to um, <laughs> specifically make sure candidate Clinton didn't win and to undercut her effectiveness should she have won. H high confidence in that. Right, yeah. high confidence in that. And then it was just the last part about, right. and th their judgment was they wanted candidate Trump to win, that that was one of the objectives. We I had testimony in this committee probably a year and a half ago by General Dunford where he was asked the question, I think by Senator Manchin, which was the nation state that he would view as our most significant adversary, and he testified based on their capacity and intent, he thought that would be Russia. Just in your domain, cyber, the mm -hmm. cyber domain, do you view Russia as an adversary of the United States? They've taken actions that have put them in the position as an adversary of the United States in the cyber domain. I'm watching them engage in behaviors that I think are destabilizing, not in our best interest in cyber. Would you also agree that France is an ally? They're a NATO ally and they're also a coalition partner in Afghanistan. Yes, sir. Um, you are aware of the reports in the last few days that there was significant evidence tying Russia to a hacking effort to destabilize the French election. Um, that's something we should take seriously when, a, when an adversary tries to destabilize the government of an ally. Would you agree? Yes, sir. There was an article in the New York Times the day before the election, Saturday the 6th, with a fascinating headline. U.S. far-right activists promote hacking attack against Macron. And the article was about the effort by groups in the United States to immediately spread the hacked documents in many instances before even WikiLeaks was able to defend them. If we should take seriously um, an adversary's cyber attack on the democracy of an ally, should we be indifferent or concerned about efforts of Americans to work together with or in parallel with an adversary attacking the democracy of an ally. I apologize. I'm not. I'm not sure I'm understanding. Okay. Again, I'm not. If you've testified in response to my question that that we ought to take seriously if an adversary tries to cyber attack and destabilize right. the democracy of an ally. If American organizations are working together with or in parallel with an adversary A like foreign Russia, counterpart, as they are trying to attack the government of an ally, France, should we be indifferent to that or should we take that seriously? We well? need to be concerned. Okay. And if we're, con if we're concerned about that, if the U.S. government should be concerned in this case, and I'll introduce this article for the record, mm. if we should be concerned about the efforts of folks in the United States to work together with or in parallel with an adversary like Russia attacking an ally like France, where should that concern lie in the federal government? Is that a law enforcement matter? Is it a DHS matter? I mean, it, is it, it an NSA matter or is it a cyber command matter? I'd argue it depends on the specifics of the scenario. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive, right. Senator. It's just, it's a very complex question. So just, um, and the, I'll put the uh, article in for the record. The, and there's, I think, more to come on this. But if individuals or organizations in the United States, for example, were taking hacked documents from an illegal Russian hack of the French system and trying to disseminate it to affect the French election, 
um, this is something we should be concerned about. Where would that concern lie within the if, government? If it's, a, if it's a legality, my first thought would be the FBI. But mm -hmm. again, that's not necessarily a fully informed opinion, but it's the first thing okay. that comes to my mind. All right. Um, let me ask you this. There's been some debate in the last couple of days about whether there's such a thing as a good shutdown of the United States government. Can you see any circumstance under which Cyber Command's mission would be benefited by a shutdown of the government of the United States? No, and if I could, I know you're asking for a yes or no. The number one issue that my workforce often raises with me is what we went through in 2013, and it's now four years later, and I still, every time there is the merest hint in the media of this even potentiality, I get... Sir, are we going to go through this again? Sir, you said this wasn't going to happen. Sir, I thought they were committed to us and our mission. Sir, I don't want to work in an environment where every couple of years I'm just getting jerked around about, am I going to come to work? Am I going to get paid? Do they value what I do? Hey, sir, we just want to do the mission. We just need the support to keep moving forward. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Sure. <clears throat> Senator Graham. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you for your service. Uh, Director Comey said a couple of days ago, I guess it was last week in the hearing that I was involved in the judiciary, that uh, Russia is still interfering in American politics. Do you concur with that? Yes. Uh, he also said that among nation states, he thought Russia had the most capability and the biggest intent uh, in terms of interfering in the future. Do you agree with that? Yes. Uh, do you agree that it was Democrats in 2016, it could be Republicans in the next election? Yes, I would argue this is not about politics. This is not about party. This is about an effort against the strategic interests of every citizen of this nation. I agree with you a thousand percent. Do you agree they could do this in congressional races, House and Senate, just not yes. presidential races? Do you agree that if somebody doesn't make them pay a price, they're going to keep doing this? Yes. All right. Uh, unmasking. A lot of talk about it. Um, are you aware of any incidental collection on 2016 candidates on both sides of the aisle? Um, I'm not going to get into specifics in an unclassified forum about collection writ large, but I will say we certainly acknowledge that incidental collection occurs, but we also have a very strict process for can what we, we build that out a bit. What we okay. do with that, yes, sir. The only way you can actually collect on an American citizen inside the country is to have a FISA warrant. And a FISA warrant, yes, sir. Or if an American citizen is incidentally in a conversation with somebody you're already following, yes, sir. Unmasking is a request to your organization. I want to know who American citizen one was. Yes, sir. You get how many of those requests did you get in 2016? Oh, I think we've. Publicly acknowledged some... Uh, Around 2,000? That's 2,000. I think it's 1,900. Okay. How many people something. can request the unmasking of American citizens? If you're an authorized recipient of the intelligence, um, we use two criteria. Number one, the requester must be asking this in the execution of their official duties. It can't be something that would be neat to know. It's number one has to be in the execution of their official duties. Number two... The revealing of the U.S. person has to provide context and greater value for the intelligence. Again, it just can't be. I'm just curious. I got you. So uh, within our government, are there 10 people, 10 groups that can do this, 20? In terms of authorizing the unmasking? Yeah. Uh, no, to make the request. Um, theory, uh, no, it's broader than that. If you are on the distribution, if you're on the authorized distribution for our intelligence reporting, you can ask. doesn't mean it gets approved, but you can ask. Is the national security... Um, Director, one of those, I mean, the, uh, the, the National Security Advisor, yes, yeah. sir. They're, they're normally on the distribution okay. for most, not all, but for Is there a record of, our of every request made? Yes. So there's a record of who made the request to unmask the conversation involving the American citizen? Yes, sir. There's a record of whether or not you granted it? Yes, sir. Is there a record of what the person did with the information once they got it? No. Um, there's also a record of the basis of, so why did we say yes? We remind every individual, if I could, once we unmask, once we authorize right. an unmasking, we authorize the unmasking only to that individual. What do I mean by that? So if we unmask a report right. that went to a particular individual, we don't unmask the report for everyone who got that report. Only the individual that we... And they're told not to share it with And they are people. specifically told a so reminder. Let, this let, doesn't let, change the classification. Right. Yes, sir. General Flynn was caught up in a conversation with a Russian ambassador. You're familiar with that story in the press? I'm familiar with the story, okay. yes, sir. Assuming he did not have a FISA warrant allowing us to collect on him, it would be a case of incidental collection following the Russian ambassador. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. 
<clears throat> we would know who, how that conversation was revealed and to, to who it was revealed through the, through the request of your agency. If we right. unmasked and it was based yeah. on an NSA right. report. Okay, I let's also say, highlight, remember, right. NSA won't be the only agency no, that potentially you. could have gotten the conversation. Yes, gotcha. sir. But you're the primary one, right? Um, I would argue, again, it depends. If you look at Title I warrants for his FBI. It's I'm not talking about warrants. I'm talking about. Incidental. So I would argue um, there's you, probably a greater potential on the FBI side than NSA, just in terms generally, in terms of collection. Of incidental. Of collection. incidental with U.S. persons. Okay, so we could either ask the FBI or you. Yes, sir. Okay. So somebody took that information that we gained through collection of, with Flynn and gave it to the Washington Post. Somehow it got to the media. That's clearly. That true. is a crime. And that's a leak, and that is illegal. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do you, are you concerned about people taking the law in their own hands, no matter how noble they think the event may be? Oh, yes, sir, which is why I've gone to my workforce in writing and said, let's make sure we understand what the professional ethos of our organization is. We do not, if I could finish, sir, we do not engage in this behavior. And if I catch you engaging in this behavior, I will hold you criminally liable and you have no place in Mr. this Mr. Chairman, I beg for 30 additional seconds. Sure. Se okay, the bottom line here, it is possible for the Congress to find out who requests uh, unmasking of American citizens, who that information was given to, and that is possible for us to know. On the NSA side, and that's part of the ongoing investigation okay. with the primary oversight committees that we're going through right now. Okay. Do you know if Susan Rice ever asked for an American citizen to be unmasked? I'd have to pull the data, sir. I apologize. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Admiral Rogers sure. for being here again, and thank you for your service. Uh, we have heard repeatedly in this room, as well as yesterday with Director Clapper, that the Russians will continue attacking the United States unless they are forced to pay a price. And you agree? Yes, sir. And right now, are they being forced to pay a price? Certainly nothing that's changing their behavior. Nothing that's changing their behavior, and clearly nothing that will change their behavior in the future, because to quote you, or paraphrase you, they have more to gain than to lose yes, by sir. continuing this kind of attack. So uh, can you recommend to us what kinds mm -hmm. of measures should be taken? And I know you've been asked this question before. In fact, you were asked when you last testified here. <laughs> And you said that tools like sanctions can be an effective option, but so far the sanctions, in my view, are way less than they should be. Do you agree that sanctions can and should be increased to provide a price that the Russians should? So have? now you're into a policy judgment. I will only say sanctions, I think, have proven to be an effective tool in many scenarios. I'm not going to argue that they're perfect and they work all the time. But there will be a point where a cyber response should be appropriate. And that Potentially, although I would highlight, when we think about deterrence, we need to think more broadly than just cyber. Just because someone comes at us in cyber doesn't mean we should automatically default to, well, it's got to be an exact response in kind. I think we need to think more broadly and play to our broader strengths as a nation. There, there's no question that the Russians attacked this country through cyber. And would you agree that Americans who colluded or cooperated with that attack also should be held accountable? Um, broadly, yes. But again, now you're starting to get into a legal and a policy piece, and that's just not my lane in the road. Well, your lane includes defending this nation yes, from sir. cyber attack. But not necessarily action against particular individuals. That's not in, in Well, let's lane. talk about a group of Americans sir. who may have colluded or cooperated with the Russians in enabling or encouraging this kind of attack. And by the way, they violated criminal laws if they did so. Wouldn't you agree that they should be held accountable and that an investigation it, of it, it is appropriate and necessary? So I agree an investigation is appropriate and necessary, and if they violated the law, then yes, sir. I'm just not an attorney. I'm not a, a lawyer. I'm not a law enforcement individual. It's not my area of expertise. But unless they're made to pay a price as well, the Russians Such will be behavior enabled will and encouraged in the future. Yes, sir. And they'll be paying less of a price as well. Right. 
Uh, I feel like we are in a time warp here because when you were last year, we agreed that we need a policy and a strategy as the chairman has articulated so well, and we still don't have one. Uh, can you tell the American people whose responsibility it is to develop that strategy and policy? So ultimately, the executive branch, um, there's multiple components in it, but ultimately it boils down to the executive branch. As I've said, look, we have a new team in place. They're working their way through this in fairness to them. Um, this is not a, this is a complicated topic with a whole lot of complexity and nuance. Um, I know that these discussions are ongoing. I've been a part of some of them. Um, I'm grateful that the team's willing to reach out and say, hey, Admiral Rogers, from your perspective, what do you think? What do you see? What are you thinking about? Um, so I, I don't want anybody walking away thinking nothing's going on, no one's thinking, and they're not attempting to proactively try to grapple with these very tough problems. Well, I, I just want to conclude by stressing again that forcing the Russians to pay a price for their attack on this country requires compelling Americans who colluded or cooperated with them to pay a price, but also a strategy and policy for knowing when there is a cyber attack on this nation, when it is an act of war that should prompt a response in the cyber domain or in other yes, military sir. domains and economic sanctions that also may force them to pay a price. And right now, our policy of deterrence is, in my view, an abject failure. Not achieving uh, the desired result. That is clearly true. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Senator. Admiral. Thank you for your service. Um, we have heard over and over again in multiple hearings, and I've got... Uh, we've got our cyber hearing and Homeland Security tomorrow, so this is really timely uh, for me, um, about poor information sharing and understanding the challenges of classified information. Uh, I've, m my staff has tried to chart the national cybersecurity structure uh, for me, and the one thing that sticks out to me is this cyber unified coordinated group. Uh, it, it appears to me to be really the only place that um, our structure is set up under PPD 41, where the private sector entities really seem to plug in to the national structure. Um, it, it, and the interesting thing is, is this cyber unified coordinated group is supposed to be in response to a significant cyber event. That's the operative phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the United Kingdom, the NCSC, has real-time collaboration with emphasis on exchange of classified information on an ongoing basis. Uh, my first question for you is, has the Cyber Unified Coordinated Group ever been called into a session? Has there ever been ongoing meetings? Of, have there been any meetings of this particular group that is laid out in PPD 41? I mean, it does, it does interact. It does operate. I, I would be the first to admit, ma'am, I have to take a question for the record about is it ever physically met? We participate in it. I'm trying to remember if it's done. Some of the work we do virtually, we'll take an issue and we'll do it, you know, via email and conference, video conference. Um, if I could, let me, if you'd like, I can take that for the record. Yeah, Just because I'm trying you a, a to think. I mean, it seems like to me the Russian thing answer. is a significant cyber event. You know, and I guess my problem is with this, I know we've spent a lot of time today struggling about what our policy is. It looks like to me that we don't really have anywhere where there is an ongoing meeting structure that integrates the private sector into what is um, – a pretty convoluted setup that we have right now. Can I, I mean, disagree slightly if I could? Sure. I, I think it's fair to say that at a sector level, we do have constructs that enable that to occur. But one of the things that Hack points out, for example, the Russian influence effort points out is we don't have a sector labeled U.S. election infrastructure. 
like oh. we do in the, in power, like we do in transportation. Although DHS has it, named it's, it's, election uh, infrastructure as part of their critical infrastructure right. now. responsibility. Yes, ma'am. Now, and and that would that happened last year, right. maybe in response to this. I'm hopefully we'll find out more tomorrow. But yes, um, it, I guess it seems to me that when someone is impacting our elections, that overlooks all of. I mean, because if you look at this list. Mm -hmm. Our national policies certainly impact chemical, commercial, communications, manufacturing, yes, dams, the Army. I mean, everything gets impacted. Right, so right. I, I guess I, I, I'm, forget about Russia for a minute. Have you, are, you, are you familiar with the U.K. model, and why aren't we? Oh, yes, ma'am, very much so. Yeah, so why aren't we doing that? What is wrong with it, and why aren't we emulating it more? So first, let's look at what the U.K. model is. They basically, I'm going to paint a simplistic picture. They turned to their intelligence structure, in this case, GCHQ, which is NSA's equivalent. They turned to GCHQ and said, you have the preponderance of capability, insight, expertise. We would like you to take a portion of that capability, and we're gonna, we are going to create this national cybersecurity center. In fact, the individual who runs it, um, a guy I've worked with for a long time, is, is a GCHQ employee. They decided that in their construct, they were comfortable with that. For us on the U.S. side, we have always been less comfortable with the idea of, well, do you want the military or do you want the intelligence world to be the primary interface, if you will, with the private sector? For our U.K. teammates, they were just very comfortable with that. And their view is it's about aligning the greatest expertise and capability with the private sector. And there's not quite the same baggage or at least history or tradition. Because of that, on the U.S. side, we, we've taken a very fundamental different approach. I'm hoping that with this new team coming in, this is an opportunity for us to step back and say to ourselves, are we happy with the way this is working? I, I agree. I haven't seen your diagram, but you've heard me say for a long time, we have got to simplify the complexity of this structure to the outside world. Because if you're in the private sector and you're trying to figure out, so who am I supposed to be dealing with? And why this time was it you, and the last time it was that organization, and the next time you're telling me you want me to go there? We have got to simplify this. Well, I'm down for that. And I, I think that one of the, the, the uh, curse uh, the, and the blessing is how protective we are of classified information. Um, and I understand that challenge. But boy, oh boy, um, it, it, pulling this group together after a significant cyber event, there's going to be a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking over whether or not more information should have been shared. And I just check it off. Thought. If I could also make one point, I agree with everything you said, but I would remind people perfect information sharing in terms of classified in and of itself will not necessarily fix every problem. If you look at no reactions question. to the Russian hack, there were plenty of organizations that were provided the specific insights who, who just opted for a variety of reasons not to react in the same way. And that wasn't about classification. So I, I just want to make people, I just want us to think of it, hey, this is the simple cure-all. You just I get do that it. and everything. And I'm I not trying it. to say that you're painting that, ma'am. No, no I, I, I know it's not the simple cure, but I know <laughs> that um, that underlying disease about information <laughs> sharing uh, goes deep and, and, yes, and it is calcified. And I want to make sure that we are aware of that. Yes, Senator. Thank you, Admiral. On behalf of Chairman Kame, Senator Shaheen, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Admiral, for being here and for the job that you do. And just to pick up a little bit on Senator McCaskill and the issue of classified versus unclassified, the challenge with, in this case, the Russian hack, with so much of the information being, unclass or being classified, is that the American public doesn't know what's going on. Mm. And when the American public doesn't know what's going on on an event of this magnitude, that is a real challenge for our democracy. And I was not able to hear your testimony and the questions, obviously, because I was at another hearing. But um, I know that there have been a number of questions about the Russian hacking and what that means. But have you talked about what, in the big picture, that means? What is Russia really trying to do with the hack of, of our electoral system, with the hack of France, with the interference in Germany, with what they've done in many of the Balkan countries, in Eastern Europe, what's their goal? Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about the U.S. side and then talk about it more broadly. So on the U.S. side, as we indicated, speaking to you now as a director of NSA, as we said in the intelligence community assessment, three primary goals we thought. First was to undercut the United States and its broad principles of democracy, to try to send a message, hey, look, these guys are every bit as inconsistent as everybody else. They're not this high on the hill, 
you know, perfectly white and perfect structure look. They, they have pettiness. They work against each other. So to undercut our democracy. Secondly, they clearly had a, a, had a preference that Canada Clinton not win. And they also wanted to ensure if she did win that she was weakened. Um, and then the report talks about the third objective was to try, and this is where NSA has a different confidence level than my other teammates, but I agree with the judgment that the third um, objective was to help candidate Trump win. If you look at the activity they've done in the United States, if you look at the activity they've done in France, in Germany, they clearly are trying to help ensure that leaders they believe might be more inclined, doesn't mean that they necessarily are, but the Russians appear to be assessing that some leaders might be more inclined to be supportive of their positions, their views, might engage in policies more favorable from a Russian perspective. You saw that just play out in, in the Russian, excuse me, in the French election, right. where there clearly was a difference between these two candidates and their views of Russia and the things they were talking in the campaign about if they won, what would some of their choices be in terms of national security policies for France and how that might impact the Russians? But, but isn't the overarching strategy not so much who the winners and losers are, but it's to undermine the public um, confidence in a democracy and how it works? And well, that, that's Putin's why I say that is a part of it. I'm sorry if I didn't make that jump on the foreign side as well. It's the same thing. I mean, there, that is an aspect of it. Right. So that just as they're engaging in a military buildup, just as they're engaging in these cyber intrusions, that the other thing they're engaging in is an effort to undermine Western democracies. That's another way they're going to undermine the West. Right. To weaken them, to forestall their ability to respond because there's no political consensus, be, you know, because they just trust their institutions as citizens, etc. Yes, ma'am. So I was in Poland after the Munich Security Conference mm. and met with a number of officials there. And some of, some of the people that we met with suggested that they were very concerned that we hadn't responded to the Russian attack of our election system. And one of the things that um, really impressed me was the person who said, you know, if, if you're not willing to do anything about what Russia did in the United States um, intervening in your electoral system, fundamental to your democracy, how should we have any confidence that you will defend us when the Russians come after us? So what does it say to our allies that we have not been willing to take any overarching action against Russia for what they did? Um, we haven't been willing to pass stronger sanctions. We haven't been willing to do other efforts to um, to take action against them because of their interference. What does that say to our allies? So I can under certainly understand why al allies would be perplexed. If this conduct occurred, you know, why aren't we seeing X, Y, or Z? I, I certainly can understand that. Well, one of the things we try to assure our allies, though, is this is one aspect of a broader set of issues. You should not question our, it depends on the, on, the, on the relationship, but in broad terms, you should not call into question our, our long-term commitment to you for Poland, for example. I don't let there be any doubt of that. So we're more committed to Poland than we are to addressing Russia's That's not what I said, ma'am. I know it's not That's what you not said, what but, but it leaves open to interpretation um, that assumption. So thank you. I, I'm yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Rogers, uh, thank you for your testimony today. As always, we appreciate your service, and would you communicate to your colleagues our appreciation for their service also. On behalf of Chairman McCain, the hearing is uh, adjourned.
wrapping up with this Senate Armed Services Committee. If you missed any of the hearing, you can view it anytime on our website. Go to cspan.org, check uh, cybersecurity threats in the